Ah, the Democratic Party? America's oldest political party that's still around today. You'd think with a name like Democratic, this party would be all about freedom, equality, and representation for the common man. But in reality, the origins of the Democratic Party are kind of messed up. Let's go back to the early 1800s and see how this hot mess got started. The year was 1828, and America was high on freedom after the Revolution and the adoption of the Constitution. The only two political parties at the time were the Democratic Republicans and the National Republicans. Catchy names, I know. Well, the Democratic Republicans had a stranglehold on the presidency, having won every election since good old Thomas Jefferson back in 1800. These Democratic Republicans advertised themselves as the party of the common man, but they were also very much the party of slavery. You see, they relied heavily on the support of southern slave states. So their idea of the common man generally didn't include, you know, black people or women. But hey, minor details. Eventually, the Democratic-Republican Party split into two factions, the Democrats and the Whigs. The Democrats were led by the ruthless and populist Andrew Jackson, while the Whigs were led by Henry Clay, John Quincy Adams, and other flashy losers. Andrew Jackson rode a wave of populism all the way to the White House in 1828, campaigning as a common man and a maverick despite being a wealthy slave owner. But old Andy sure could put on a good show to relate to the working class. He let his unruly mob of supporters trash the White House during his inauguration party. Man of the people. With Jackson and his Democrats in power, they worked to push Native Americans off their land, leading to the Trail of Tears. Tragic? Yes. Horrifying? Absolutely. But did it open up new lands for cotton plantation expansion and slave labor? You betcha. Manifest destiny, baby. Anyway, over the next few decades, slavery continued to divide the nation. The Whigs tried to take a moderate approach, but the Democrats repeatedly defended and expanded slavery. Whenever abolitionists made progress limiting slavery, the Democrats pushed back hard to protect their precious free labor. By 1854, the Whig Party was dying out, and the Democrats even more firmly controlled the southern states. But then, the Kansas-Nebraska Act changed everything. This new law said new states could choose for themselves whether to allow slavery. Basic federalism, right? Well, this opened up a huge can of worms that led to bleeding Kansas, a brutal preview of the violence to come. The Whigs totally crumbled under the pressure. But like a phoenix rising from the ashes, the new Republican Party emerged in 1854, bringing together Northern Democrats, Whigs, and abolitionists. They were like slavery, not cool, bros. This scary new party threw slavery's future into uncertainty. So when the 1860 election rolled around, the Democrats were split into Northern and Southern factions. The Northern Democrats nominated Stephen Douglas, who tried to avoid the slavery issue with his proposal of popular sovereignty. But the Southern Democrats said, heck no. They broke off and nominated the pro-slavery John C. Breckinridge as their own candidate. With the Democrats divided, the Republican Abraham Lincoln won in a four-way race without even appearing on most Southern ballots. The South saw the writing on the wall for slavery's future under Lincoln. So they said see you later to the USA and started seceding to form the Confederacy, kicking off the Civil War. Thanks a lot, Democrats. After the war, during Reconstruction, the Democratic Party strongly opposed civil rights for freed slaves. They claimed the Republican plans were corrupt, even though the Dems were the ones enabling voter suppression. When Reconstruction ended in 1877, Southern Democrats passed Jim Crow laws to legalize racism. Not a good look. In the late 1800s, Democrats continued to be the party of racist policies and white supremacy in the South, while Republicans gradually became more progressive on civil rights. Democratic President Woodrow Wilson even played the KKK propaganda film Birth of a Nation at the White House. Yikes. Over time, the Democratic Party slowly began to change, thanks to civil rights pioneers like Eleanor Roosevelt and new leaders like John and Robert Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson. 
But it took until the 1960s, a full century after the Civil War, for Democrats to fully embrace the civil rights movement. Talk about being on the wrong side of history. So to recap, the Democrats spent their first 130 years defending slavery, leading the Confederacy, opposing Reconstruction, upholding Jim Crow laws, and generally impeding civil rights and racial equality at every turn. But then in a wild plot twist, by the 1960s, they somehow managed to flip the script and portray themselves as the forward-thinking progressives. Quite the rebranding effort, I must say. And now, the party of Jefferson Davis and George Wallace wraps itself in the mantle of civil rights and social justice. What a long, strange trip it's been. It just goes to show that political parties and ideologies can change over time. But it's important to remember where they came from. The Democrats may now be on the right side of history when it comes to civil rights. But their past is checkered with racism, slavery apologism, and segregationism. So the next time you think about the Dems' high horse on equality and inclusion, remember the skeletons in their closet. They've come a long way, but it's been a bumpy road.